we certainly have a sort of stellar lineup of, of sessions for the afternoon. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the highlight is our first keynote of this uh, IC 2019 Congress. And uh, I'm going to introduce the introducer. And uh, uh, introducing our keynote speaker today will be uh, Pollyanna Ree. Uh, now, Pollyanna is the Andrew Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Environmental Humanities, currently with the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities, soon to be the Humanities Institute of Illinois. Pollyanna received her PhD in History and the Theory of Architecture from Columbia University. And we're especially delighted to have uh, Pollyanna um, involved in the Congress because uh, next fall she'll be joining the faculty here uh, at the University of Illinois. She'll be joining the Department of Landscape Architecture as an assistant professor. So thanks, Pollyanna. Thank you, Dr. Wood. It is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Kimberly Wasserman. Wasserman's work as an environmentalist and grassroots leader made her a recipient of the 2013 Goldman Environmental Prize after she led a successful campaign to pass the Chicago Clean Power Ordinance and helped an over decade long fight to close two coal fired power plants and to push for remediation and redevelopment at those sites. As an executive director of the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, she works with organizers to improve bus routes for job access and establish a new 23-acre park in Little Vi Village, Chicago, where she was born and raised. She entered the world of environmental activism in 1998 after her three-month-old son suffered an asthma attack despite having no family history of asthma. After researching the connection between asthma and air pollution, she turned her attention to coal-fired plants in her neighborhood and became involved with the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. During her time there, she has helped to organize community leaders to successfully build new playgrounds, community gardens, remodel a local school park, and force a local polluter to upgrade facilities to meet current laws. She's also the chair of the Illinois Commission on Environmental Justice, and we're so glad to have her at the University of Illinois campus. Please welcome Kim Wasserman. Hello. Sorry. Sorry, I'm still not used to doing these things. Sorry, give me one second. Um, so, good afternoon. Uh, muy buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Kim Wasserman. Um, I come from the Little Village community on the southwest side of Chicago. Um, this year, our organization is celebrating 25 years um, as an organization, which is super exciting. And I get to say that I've been there 21 of the 25 years. So, that's pretty exciting as well. Um, and after 21 years, you'd think I get used to talking in public, but it's still a uh, nerve wracking thing. So, my apologies if I talk too fast, um, if I get really excited. Um, if I use acronyms and people don't know what they mean, please let me know. Um, if you have questions or, again, I say something too fast, let me know. I'll repeat it. Um, and if at any point in time folks have questions, I am very much a firm believer that I'm not talking to people, I'm talking with people. Um, and so I want to make sure that um, what I'm saying is accessible to folks in whatever manner possible. So, um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, too. I'm going to touch on a couple of the things that were mentioned in the introduction. Um, and I should note, this is my first time using a, a computer to talk. So I have, normally I just wing it. Um, but I really wanted to make sure that I hit the right points this time. So I went through the effort of writing. So bear with me. This is a first time experiment for me. Um, and I didn't get as far as PowerPoint. So like, <laughs> we can just imagine the conversation as we're talking, if that's all right. So. Um, Again, um, thank you so much to the 2019 IC Congress uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, so just to give you a little background on myself, um, born and raised on the southwest side of Chicago, um, I introduce myself a lot as being a product of the Chicago public school system. 
the Chicago Public Transit Authority system, the Chicago Public Library system, the Chicago Public Park system. I am a product of the public good um, that is possible in an inner city like Chicago. Um, so I very much believe um, that cer certain things in our communities are meant to be public. Um, they're not meant to um, raise revenue. They're actually there to provide a service, uh, a basic need for our community. Um, and having had the privilege of being born um, on the southwest side of Chicago and having, had the priv and having the privilege to vote, I also, at a very early age, understood my civic responsibility. And I would nerd out a lot of times as a young person, like being like, we have a right to vote. Like, you have civic rights. And people are like, the what are you talking about? I'm like, you have rights. Like, do you not understand that, like, you can change the way things happen in our community? Um, to the point in sixth grade, um, we have local school councils that were fought for in Chicago um, where parents get to represent their community and students get to represent their community. And in sixth grade, our seventh and eighth grade student council members were not allowed to vote on our school principal. And I remember getting enraged and being like, this is an outrage. You have the right to vote. And so I organized my first sit-in in sixth grade in support of the seventh and eighth graders on something that had nothing to do with me whatsoever. <laughs> but I was like, damn it, man, this is your right as students. And so we organized a student and we won. The principal that we didn't want to get hired got hired anyway. But nonetheless, um, it was about the fact that um, from a young age, my parents, uh, both who are community organizers and activists, um, dragged us around to all kinds of protests and rallies and marches and hunger strikes. You know, from a very young age, it was instilled in me what my rights were, it was also instilled in me that I was a woman of color um, with curly big hair that didn't mean the normal standards of what professionalism, if you will, were out there. And that I was gonna have to fight really hard for my identity. And I was gonna have to fight really hard to ensure that my voice was a part of conversations when normally my voice would be um, pushed to the sidelines. Um, I struggled with the privilege of coming from a stepfather who had a, a last name of Ehrman. So when people would say, Kimberly Ehrman, and I'd stand up, they'd say, no. We said, Kimberly Ehrman. I said, I know who you said. That's me, um, right? So for, for me as a young person, um, this is not the line of work that I thought I was gonna end up doing. I, as a young person, I was like, protests, marches, rallies, did all that, I'm straight, I'm gonna go to college, and who knows what's gonna happen. Um, and at the age of 21, as was mentioned, I had my first son. Um, I was uh, working part-time, I was going to school full-time, and I was on public aid. Um, and my son had his first asthma attack. Um, and so as a mom with no car, having to go to the emergency room on the bus, um, I freaked out and I wanted to understand um, what did I do wrong? What did I not do to take care of my child, right? My stepfather is a doctor, eating salads my whole life, right? working out, understand, watching my cholesterol since the age of 19. I like to think a little, you know, somewhat a little chunky, but a little somewhat healthy, you know, health uh, conscious. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, but I wanted to understand what did I do wrong? Could I have done something different in my pregnancy? Could I have done something different in the first three months of my child's care to ensure that this didn't happen to him? Now, yes, uh, my child's father has asthma. Yes, there's asthma in my family. Yes, it's hereditary. But there's also something about where you live that plays into this. And so I remember uh, being in the hospital 24 hours overnight and the doctor being like, well, if you don't mind me asking you, where do you live and what's in your neighborhood? And I remember stopping and thinking to myself, well, that's a damn good question. I was like, I know where I live in the context of I live in Little Village, but like what's in my neighborhood? People, houses? Like I'm not really sure, like what, what, are, we, what are we going for here? And he was like, well, industry, right? Like how close are you to the highway? What's the, what's the industry ratio in your neighborhood? And I was like, well, damn, that's a good question. Like I've never thought about that. It never dawned on me to stop and think, what's in my own backyard, right? Like what is the industry that's in my neighborhood? And so I uh, applied soon after that. Once I understood my kid has, had asthma, once I understood um, what nebulizers were and like what the treatment was gonna look like. Um, I quit my job and I went to go apply at the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization because they were in the midst of trying to figure out this same question. This organization had come about because at a local school, Chicago public schools are strapped for budgets. Principals have to work with what they got. The principal needed to replace the windows and retar the roof. She got a discount, she got a contractor who was gonna skirt around the asbestos and lead abatement right, was gonna do the roof uh, tarring when kids were in school during summer school, right? And so these kids were impacted by their school being renovated, right? They were exposed to lead, they were exposed to asbestos, there was countless asthma attacks in the school because we have no air conditioning, teachers have fans. What are they sucking in? All of the tar air, that, you know, all of that smell of tar from the roof. So the parents had come together and fought. These are blue collar workers. These are folks who do lead and asbestos removal. These are folks who do roofs for a living and they understood that there's laws and regulations. But they also understood that for whatever reason in their neighborhood, those laws and regulations weren't being followed. 
Was it because we're a low income community of color? Was it because we're primarily immigrants? Was it because we don't speak English? Right, we wanted, folks didn't, couldn't, couldn't understand. Do those things play into context when it comes to these things happening? And lo and behold, they do, right? And so as an organization, they came, as parents, they came together and they formed this organization. And when they won the victories of getting the roof retarded at another time, when they won the victory of kids um, being tested for lead exposure and um, asbestos exposure, they realized that the environmental racism they were dealing with wasn't just in the school building. It was actually all across the neighborhood. They found that a record number of students in the school had asthma and that a record number of their parents had asthma. But when you look statistically at Mexican and Mexican Americans in the nation, our rate was astronomically higher than the national average. And they wanted to understand why. And I was asking myself that same question at the time. And so I came together with the organization, applied to be an organizer, and got the job. And the first two years of my job was going around in the neighborhood and asking folks, do you notice anything different in this neighborhood? Do you, what kind of health effects do you have now that you've moved to this neighborhood? Do you see anything different? How much asthma do you deal with in your family? Um, and more importantly, what's in our backyard? And in going through our uh, community, what we found was not just one of two coal power plants located in our backyard. We also found 45% of our land in our neighborhood is actually designated for industrial use, right? So here we were in this very populated community five miles, five square miles in radius, about 100,000 people were very densely, densely compacted in. Um, I think we have more people per square foot than New York City um, in our neighborhood alone. Um, that's how dense we are. Um, we also house uh, the largest metropolitan jail in the United States, Cook County Jail, um, and they make up part of our um, uh, community as well. Um, and so it wasn't by chance that we started to, we started to understand like of all of our community, most of it seems to be used for industrial corridor. The second biggest use seems to be for the incarceration of black and brown people. And then the rest of it is what we live in, right? And so again, we started to understand like, was it by chance that our neighborhood was created like this? Was it by chance that these things happened? And lo and behold, we found out it wasn't. Um, and so um, what we started to do, um, when I joined the organization again, as I mentioned, um, we started to do that research and we wanted to understand not just what this plant did, but how it functioned, right? We wanted to understand what is the exactly, what does it mean when you burn coal? Like most people in our neighborhood straight up thought that they were like the charcoal factory. Like this is where Kingsford charcoal was made when you said they burn coal. They're like, oh, this is where the briquettes come from. Not so much, not so much where the briquettes come from, right? So we had to start to explain to people what is the life cycle of coal, right? We wanted to understand where does our coal come from? And we actually found out that our coal came from uh, the Colorado area. Um, but in this case, we really wanted to understand how other communities were impacted by coal. Um, and so we linked up with communities in West Virginia um, and started to understand about mountaintop removal. We started to understand about the extraction of coal from low income white communities in particular. We started to understand how their whole communities were being destroyed just for the extraction of coal. And that coal was then being transported on trains and trucks into our neighborhoods, low income communities of color to burn. And then the byproduct of that burning was coal ash. And that that coal ash was also ending up in low income communities of color all across the South, in unlined ponds, um, in um, unlicensed, um, uh, uh, what's working in unlicensed um, storage facilities, um, and so we started to understand that the life cycle of coal, that there was actually a life cycle of coal. That this wasn't just about our little community in Little Village. That this was about countless communities who, throughout the life cycle of coal, were being impacted. Um, and as we started to want to understand, well, what does this actually mean? What are the actual numbers? Right, like how many people actually in our community are being impacted? And so it was a school of, uh, Harvard School of Public Health that released a study in 2012 um, that actually put numbers and actually informed us that 40 plus people a year died prematurely in our neighborhood because of these coal power plants. That 2,000 emergency room visits were happening because of these coal power plants. That over 1,500 asthma attacks were happening just in our neighborhood alone, just in our one little neighborhood with our one coal power plant. That a neighborhood next to, it, next to us with their own coal power plant had their own statistics. And most importantly, that our coal power plant and the one next door were ranked number one and number three dirtiest coal power plants in the nation, right? So we wanted to understand so we could actually put a face, put a number to that, that, that our gut feeling was telling us that something was wrong, that there was, that there was actual proof to that. And so we went to City Hall and we went to the mayor and we said, look, this is outrageous. How, how do you allow 40 people to die prematurely for the sake of coal? And this electricity wasn't for our city or wasn't for our state. It was actually sold on the open market. So it was fine to sacrifice an entire community of low-income communities of color so that a fossil fuel company could make money off of coal. That was perfectly acceptable. 
And when we went to our um, local government, what we were told was that same message, that our community could be sacrificed, that these jobs that employed nobody, and I mean not a single person in our neighborhood, that those jobs were more important than the lives and the well-being of our communities. And as a mom, as a community resident, I was not gonna sit idly by and let that be the answer. And so for 12 years, we fought. We fought like hell. Um, but we not only fought to shut down the coal power plant, we also found out that in doing this work, we had to fight to ensure that our message wasn't greenwashed by other people. So while we were out here saying we want to shut down, there was politicians talking about, oh, they just don't know what they want. They're a little too radical. What they really want is a cleanup. And we would say, nah, dude, let me be crystal. Let me be crystal clear with you. What we want is a shutdown, not a cleanup. You cannot clean coal. There is no such thing as clean coal. You cannot have it that way. It is, we want no coal power plant in our neighborhood. Um, we had to fight to ensure that our demands weren't negotiated down for political gain. Many times because we, are a small, we were a small non-for-profit with no policy game. All we had were organizers who were minimally paid. We didn't have the, we didn't have the power to go to Springfield and affect policy. We had, to, um, we had to lean on fellow advocates, lean on what we call big green organizations to go to Springfield and make our demands for us. And what we found was that we not only had to fight for those demands, but when they would go to Springfield, they would sell us out and they would come back and be like, well, Here's the best we could do. What? Here's the best we could do. Instead of the 2015 rules, we got them extended 2020. You, only, you want 60% lead reduction, we got 25% lead reduction. And we were like, what the? What, what, ha what happened? What happened to what we agreed upon when you went in the room? Um, we also had to fight to understand how these decisions were made in the first place. Who thought it would be okay to put a coal power plant in, a, in city limits, right? Who thinks it's okay to put coal ash ponds in the middle of low-income communities of color, right? Who thinks it's okay for coal power plants to run without permits for nine years in the state of Illinois, right? Somebody somewhere makes that decision and says, this is okay. There is not a problem here, and there are systems that uphold that decision-making process, right? Very racist, very um, uh, white-centered privilege, uh, processes that hold up those spaces that make those decisions. And what we had to do was step back and say, all right, let's understand those systems and let's understand how do we best either influence those systems or break those systems up. Because the reality is, from our community's perspective, this is not just a, a fight about climate change, this is inherently a fight against capitalism. And I realize that that's a bold statement to make for a lot of people, but that is the reality of the fight and the analysis that we see as frontline communities of color. We can talk all we want offline after this about whether or not capitalism is there, but I just wanna make that point and hold it while we're standing here, okay? <laughs> um, right, and so not only do we wanna understand the, the processes, but also the policies, right? Who is making these policies? Who is deciding that a community like ours that has the second worst air quality in the state should have more pollution in it? Right, who sits in what tower, in where, in what city, in, what's, in what place and decides, I will make all decisions here for them. Right? Like who, who gets to do that? Um, and want to understand how, again, we can go in there and break that up. Um, and how can we create the policies that we need and push those policies forward at a local level as well. Right? And not get our message washed out. Not get our demands um, renegotiated. But we ourselves are the folks not only at the front line of our community, but are either at the table making these conversations, and if we're not at the table, or as people like to say, we're being served at the table, then we'll build our own damn table and have these conversations. So, um, so we not only fought to do that, but then we realized that in all that fighting, right, because it was 12 years of a campaign and figuring these things out takes a long time, right, and figuring all those things out, one of the most important things we also figured out, that at the end of the day, if we are not aligned, principally or value-wise, this is not gonna work. And if you, one thing folks should walk away from understanding about environmental justice is this is not just a notion that all lives, this is not just a notion that all lives, all people are equal. This is a, un, this is a movement with 17 principles. 17 principles that ground us in understanding the lived experiences of low-income communities of color, of lived experience of what it is to be people of color and experimented on without consent, right? To be 17 principles that allow us to understand the role that corporations play um, in the destruction of our planet, right? Values that allow us to understand where the US military plays a role in climate change as the largest polluter in this world. 
right? It's these values that center black lives, that center trans lives as part of our conversations that move our work forward. And what folks had to understand is just because we all believe the trees are great, just because we all believe that pollution is bad, doesn't mean that we can come around the table and sum kumbaya and all get along, right? When, when this administration and folks who uphold administration are systematically taking people out that look and speak and talk like me, that's a problem. And if we can't align value-wise, then there's no, there's no, it's not worth it for us to front like we are getting along and can do good work. Right, the fact of the matter is we have to have the tough conversations with groups, with allies, with organizations to say, we speak for ourselves. That when you fight for our community, you fight for all communities. That when you fight against, in our case, Hilco, the new developer who wants to buy our coal power plant, you're also fighting over policing in our communities. You're also fight fighting the closing of our schools in our communities. You're also fighting the closing of the mental health clinics in our communities, right? That all of these things are interconnected and that they are not singularly apart. And if you can't support that, then perhaps we are not the organization or the community for you to come into and help support. And I realize that that is a fucked up thing to say. And I realize that that turns off a lot of people. But I have spent so many years of the last 21 years helping folks deal with their privilege, helping folks deal with um, what they bring to the table and having to check them that after years of burnout, I had to take a step back and say, who am I in this for? Am I in this for the education of folks who have the privilege and power to get educated? Or am I in this for my community to have a voice and say what happens? And I had to take a step back and say, I'm here for my neighborhood. I'm here for my people. And that's who I fight for. So we encourage folks to definitely check out the environmental justice principles, but also the Hamez principles of democratic organizing. These are very important principles that we uphold as part of our work, and they are the guiding principles to how we get down with folks. So when folks come into our community and say, yes, I want to support you, cool. I'm going to need you to check out these two documents. I'm going to need you to read through them. I'm going to need you to make sure that we align value-wise, and we can work together. And if not, then perhaps we're not the best organization for you. Right? And again, that requires work on both ends. Right? Organizations to identify and stand true to who they are, and folks who are wanting to come into community and help to also check themselves and figure out what do I bring to the table besides just a martyr complex or besides just, just wanting to help. What else do I bring to the conversation? Um, so alignment is what, it's what we call the alignment process. Um, we call it building equity and alignment. That's, what, that's the work that we look to do. That's the work that we learned from this process is that we had to build equity and alignment um, in order for this work to be truly successful. I think one of the greatest examples of that is the climate, uh, the youth climate marches that just happened um, last week? I don't even know what day of the week it is. Is that last week? Yes, okay. That happened last week. Um, if folks got to check it out in New York City, one of the amazing things that got to happen was that it was frontline communities of color that led the youth climate march. Right, because again, low-income communities of color are the least to contribute to the climate problem, but the first to feel the impacts of it. These are the communities that have been fighting on the ground for years, connecting the economic justice movement to the labor movement, to the environmental justice movement, understanding how these things are impacting our neighborhood and pushing for frontline solutions that lift up local economies. Um, and in many cities, we didn't see that connection. We didn't see folks reaching out to those frontline communities to say, where are you at and how does this movement help support you? Because trust, as lovely as Greta is, she's not the first young person to have this conversation. Trust to know that she's not the first to testify at the UN. But she got mad play because of the color of her skin and the country she came from, right? And I hate to be the, I'm always down for a good story and I'm always down for good light on our movement, but it has to come in recognition of whose movement are you lifting up? Are you truly lifting up all of our movements or just those who make the front page news because of what they look like? I'm sorry, I'm gonna grab some water real quick. Give me two seconds. So what does that look like for us in our community? Um, part of the conversation that we had with a lot of the young people last week was around the fact that we spent 12 years shutting down this coal power plant. We fought to clean up our air quality. And then the city decided, you know what would make sense on this property? A 1 million square foot warehouse with hundreds of diesel trucks coming in and out of it. I should, I should clarify that before that, um, they wanted to put a green casino because our mayor was convinced that if they just put a casino but made it green, that like it would be great. And we were like, absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. You want to talk about the highest level of greenwashing? That would be it. Um, and so we fought that one. But then here came this developer, especially, and he came at a time when um, cities were literally killing themselves and bending over backwards to try to get Amazon in the door, right? Countless cities were giving away tax breaks, giving away money. So here comes Hilco. Hilco Global is a global corporation um, who goes around buying old coal power plants and old industry and turning them into economic development. Their biggest clients happen to be Amazon, Under Armour, Under Armour? Um, and some other um, like large scale um, warehouse um, and shippers. And so they bought the coal power plant and they are now gonna be attempting to bring hundreds of trucks into our neighborhood. And so we went from fighting a coal power plant with no jobs that polluted our community to now fighting a one million square foot warehouse whose jobs we have been promised are gonna be great because warehouse jobs are fabulous these days, let's be clear. They're all temp jobs, they have no benefits, and two thirds of warehouse workers are on public aid. So, win for everybody on that one. Um, and then we're promised these great truck driving jobs, right? And if you know anything about truck driving jobs, they're some of the worst. Uh, truck drivers are getting uh, their wages stolen on an alarming rate. Plus, the air quality in the um, box truck that you uh, sit in um, is uh, filled with particulate matter. Um, and it's actually been found that um, uh, truck drivers have a 50% greater chance of dying of a heart attack because of the air quality in their truck. Um, the particulate matter actually hardens your arteries. I, 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 Science down on this. Uh, the PM harden your arteries, which then make it harder for your blood to flow, which can lead to you having a heart attack. Most truck drivers don't have health insurance. So who exactly is gonna cover them when they have a heart attack? Not really sure. Um, and so this is the conversation that the city is currently having with us. And this is a conversation that is happening not just in Chicago, it is happening all across the state of Illinois. Um, Illinois is closing coal-fired coal power plants at an alarming rate, which is great, right? They were closing down coal power plants, but what is not happening is the conversation with the communities most impacted by those closures, both the workers and the communities right around them, to figure out what does an alternative to this economy look like. And what cities are doing is they're hedging their bets on e-commerce. And what they are failing to understand is that is a bubble just like the real estate bubble that will burst. And along with it bursting, it is going to be bursting the pocketbooks of countless county healthcare systems because of the astronomical asthma and respiratory illnesses that come along with it. Right? One of the things that we found as this warehouse was being proposed for our neighborhood is that in fact it is non-white Hispanics that do most online shopping, which is, I don't know why it's non-white Hispanics, but that's what the word was. Um, and it's actually uh, black and Latino communities that feel the impacts of that online purchasing the most. Right, So here we are as communities of color not doing a lot of online purchasing, but where are those warehouses and trucks? In our neighborhood. Where does that package come from when you want it in a day or less, is that where we're at now? Sorry, I don't shop Amazon, so I'm not sure what the, is it like two hours, is that true or no? No, okay, so like if it's a day or less, right, like that's because the warehouses are coming into the city now. That's because as we push for more consumerism, as we continue to buy, 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 we don't give thought to where those things come from. We don't give thought to what is the process for that thing to get to my house. We don't think of where does that truck come from to be able to get me my, I don't know, headphones, right, in a day. Right, and those, usually those spaces are in our communities. And so for us, this is a larger conversation, not just about how do, you, how do you shut down coal power plants, this is a larger conversation of how do we just transition from an extractive economy to an inclusive economy, right? In our neighborhood, we don't want casinos, we don't want warehouse jobs, we don't want truck driving jobs. We are a food-based economy, right? People in my neighborhood know how to do urban agriculture and agriculture at large scale. People want access to land to be able to grow. Last year in our garden alone, we put out five, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 5,000 uh, 5, pounds of food last year out of our community garden, right, with 47 families who pay zero to no money to grow um, in our community garden, right? We were able to feed that many more people just out of a simple little community garden. So for us, the idea to be able to empower folks to be able to grow their own food and have a, a closed food-based system in our neighborhood, that is economic growth. That is how you do just transition. That is sustainable growth for our neighborhood. What it's not is these warehouse jobs that we are being, um, being proposed. And again, I say this because we're seeing coal power plants 
um, and not just coal power plants being shut down, but currently um, the state of Illinois is actually um, working on coal ash rules because as these coal power plants shut down, folks need to figure out what do you do with this byproduct. And what we're seeing once again is that environmental justice communities, communities that have been, have been housing this coal ash, and not just the coal ash, they've also been housing other industry, right? Their access to healthcare isn't great, their jobs aren't great, right? And so one of the things that we've tried to lift up as part of this is that it's not just about the coal power plant. The coal power plant is only one of many industries. And when you add all that stuff up and you look at the cumulative impact, that is much more astounding than just talking about the one industry. So when we talk about EJ communities and the need to get rid of coal ash in their neighborhoods, it's because they're already dealing with 18,000 other things that are impacting their health. So yes, they should be prioritized to get rid of this shit. Yes, they should be first on the list to have a conversation on what it looks like to work with EJ communities. And what we're seeing is once again, those communities aren't, aren't being prioritized, right? Those communities are not, because folks don't wanna deal with these conversations because they're too hard, they're too rough. We don't politically align, there's no money. Right? And what we need to be able to do is fight to be able to push past those conversations and figure out how do we prioritize these? Where do we find the money? How do we have these uh, industries be accountable so that when they jet, they're responsible for all the shit they leave behind and that they don't just have the right to walk away and be like, oh, peace, sorry. This is not my responsibility anymore. Right? And so when we talk about environmental justice, when we talk about um, our communities having a voice, it ranges across the board. Um, but there are things currently happening right now in our state in which people can get behind, in which people can support, and which people can flex their privilege and power and ability um, to be able to help our communities fight for the, just, for the future that we really want. So I'm going to stop there because I talk a lot um, and see if folks have any questions. for all of us when I say thank you for a really uh, fascinating, excellent, and joyful uh, talk. Thank um, you. My question is, is um, as an organizer, um, how do you balance the need to listen to the concerns of community members and, and engage them and meet them where they are um, <clears throat> with the need to um, put forward your own uh, analysis, which can be you know, radical anti-capitalist and not something that people are necessarily gonna, gonna endorse um, or be friendly to at a first um, meeting, right? How do you balance yeah. the need, how, how do you balance that, um, their concerns with your own analysis that you've developed over the years? Absolutely, so first is um, in understanding that it's not just our analysis, it's building with our community, but it, most of our organizers, when they go door to door, they don't talk about our work for probably the first three to four sessions. It's really about listening to where folks are at. Um, you'd be surprised, and I'm sure it's not very different here. If you go knock on somebody's door and just ask them a simple, how are you? How, let me ask this question. How many of people in this room have had somebody come knock on your door and ask you how the hell you doing? Not a single, I have, because I got organizers in my neighborhood, so I get, <laughs> they show up at my door all the time. Right, so first and foremost is like, we don't talk to each other. So how do we actually spend the time listening to folks and listening where they're at? In doing that, then as organizers, we are trained to start to listen for things that correlate to our work. I don't have a job. I can't pay my bills. My kid is sick. I'm concerned about the school closing. I saw a cloud of smoke, whatever. whatever. There's too many rats. Whatever the conversation may be, there's usually always a link back to the work that we do. And it's through those conversations to say, well, why is it that you think, you're, why is it that you think the job market is so bad? What's happening on a, on, a, on a national scale, right, that's causing these jobs? Like, what are the options that are out there? Right, and start to talk, what kind of job would you like to have? What, what are you good at? What are the skill sets that you bring? And can we as an organization put those skill sets to use? Right, doing something that can help benefit the community. Right, and you'd be surprised how many times folks are willing to put their skill sets because nobody's asked them. Nobody has asked them to come out and put your skill set to work on something that you genuinely care about. Right, it's been, hey, let me offer you a free lunch if you get on this bus and go uh, stand out at this rally for me. Or hey, I got a free t-shirt for you, right, if you go to this thing, right? But, it's, it's not about taking that step further to try to understand where folks are at. And so it's, it's making those connections and then through that lived experience, asking the question, why do these things happen, right? Like why is it that we are pushing so much e-commerce in this country? Why is it that Walmart doesn't pay taxes on their goods until they get to Joliet, Illinois, and they don't pay any taxes until then, right? Like why is it um, that most folks who work at Walmart are on public aid as well, right? Like those conversations are not far off. 
And folks have that lived experience of having worked at Walmart, of having shopped at Walmart to say, oh shit, I didn't realize that that was connected to this, that this was then connected to that. Right, and it's helping folks make those links on their own and not coming and talking to folks and like, you know, breathing it. It's, it's through compassion and listening and working with them to make those connections. And it's, it's freaking time, dude. Like honestly, it's time, it's commitment, um, and it's humbling and understanding, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so speaking of uh, talking to each other, um, I'm from North Carolina, um, and as I know you know, right, we actually just came from our um, Clean Water North Carolina conference this past weekend, and we were talking about coal ash. Um, so we have coal fire power plants, but we also um, have a really huge repository of the coal ash, which I'm sure is coming from. Yep. Um, and I had been wondering um, about the extent to which there have been conversations um, sort of amongst all of these constituencies. I'm sure that people will show up at conferences, but sort of kind of um, collaborative efforts, right? Because I know um, what, what, what they're talking about now in North Carolina is um, they're excavating that coal ash pits, but now they're talking about burning the coal ash. So we are, yeah, so we, so I just, <laughs> just like, and just having kind of, um, yeah, just wondering the extent to which we, these conversations yeah. are already happening and, um, yeah, how those of us who are kind of adjacent to these struggles, whatever, can intervene or support. Absolutely. So here's what I can say. No on the burning of coal ash, like, let's just be clear there. Not a good idea. Um, but I, so one is, I think that, um, so Illinois is rolling out its coal ash rules and is going around talking to folks. And I just want to acknowledge that Chris Pres and all the EJ officers in the room. So if I get any of this wrong, I want to point to Chris. Um, so um, part of what we've been doing is one is uh, putting out the call to communities all across Illinois to say, you all need to like, however we can support in getting your voice into this conversation to, un to impact this law is going to be crucial. So how, what is a technical support if it's capacity, if it's getting lawyers, if it's getting engineers, right? And so that's why I'm excited to come to spaces like this because how do we in the state of Illinois come together better with Champaign, Springfield, UIC, but how do our institutions come together with our folks working on the ground to bring the science? Because the fact of the matter is, if we don't bring the science, they are not going to give it to us. And I say that to you after 21 years of us having to do citizen, what they call citizen science, we call community science. We have to do our air, own air monitoring. We have to do our own soil sampling. We have to do our own water sampling. I literally feel like I have like somewhat of a PhD in like sciences in that sense because I've learned how to do all those things. Wasn't educated, but I've learned how to do them, right? I can run a purple air like nobody's business. Right, so like those are the, right? So part of it is how do we flex spaces like this to provide that technical support in a valued and aligned manner to folks on the ground to empower them to be able to impact, right? And it's really about, historically the issue has been, I'm gonna be honest, universities and frontline communities struggle to meet with each other. We either get undersold on grants, we get, our work gets co-opted, we can't be PIs, I've struggled right on that one, like how does a person without a college education get to be a PI? I'm a PI, goddammit, um, right? So like how do we, how do we do those things and fight for those things? So one is being clear about like, it's not gonna be easy peasy, right? Like we're gonna have to work through some of those things, but the fact of the matter is when those things can come together in an aligned manner, they are able to influence decisions like whether or not to burn coal ash. And I say that not just locally, but also know that there is a huge national community that supports calls like that. There's Climate Justice Alliance. There's a grassroots glo uh, global grassroots justice alliance as well. There's, there's national networks of folks who are looking to support what folks are doing on the ground and echo those messages as well. So I think it's a question of plugging in, but most importantly, being ready to have those value and align conversations to ensure the work can, can collaboratively come together. Please don't run, walk. <laughs> So uh, as part of the introduction, we heard that you're the head of uh, an Illinois environmental justice group. Uh, you know, how's that working out? Is state government responsive to uh, your sure. concerns? And I think I get the answer that it's not fully or not at all, whatever. And then you know, the follow-up question is, what could we be doing here in Champaign to help you? 
Absolutely. So um, I am the chairwoman for the Illinois Environmental Justice Commission. Um, I will be honest in saying it's the first time I've ever been on a commission. So welcome to Springfield 101. Um, Chris Presnell is a fellow commissioner with me um, as EJ officer um, in the state. Um, and the commission is made up of uh, frontline community groups, industry, um, and state um, institutions. Um, one of our biggest problems is the lack of power. Right, is the lack to be able to actually like uh, 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 initiate or affect uh, actual change. But what we can do is provide support to a certain extent and clarity around like what's happening and give, um, and give advice to processes that are happening. So one of the things that the commission was able to do was um, help fight to ensure that the uh, Future Energy Jobs Act that passed in Illinois um, actually um, had a map to identify environmental justice communities under the Solar for All program. That was huge. Um, up until uh, then, the state had a very um, loose definition of what environmental justice communities meant. Um, and what we were able to do, well, what we were able to help do was help the state actually create a whole mapping system, which you can go online and put in your address and find out whether or not you live in an, technically in an environmental justice community based on different factors. Now, if you don't qualify, you can also self-designate. That's huge, right? Like to be able to come together as a commission to be able to actually show on a map in Illinois that there are environmental justice communities, right? Now it's only under one program, how we grow that definition into, onto other programs and other policies and decision making arenas, I think is what we strive for. Uh, but before getting that, the fact of the matter is, is that we need allies like this school to potentially be commissioners to bring in that research, bring in that knowledge base that's currently missing partially from those spaces, right? Like, again, we, it's us, it's industry, it's um, the state, and then the education community is truly missing as part of that narrative, right? And so one, and we've seen, I was on NEJAC, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. We had folks from Michigan State on there, uh, Paul Mohai, right? Like we had different professors from different universities where environmental justice was centered um, as part of their curriculum. And that is truly lacking, I feel like, in our, um, in our commission to be able to bring that voice for potential projects, work, there's courses on environmental justice being taught in these institutions. How does the commission correlate, if at all, with those spaces? So I think, I, and I don't speak for Chris, but I think as commissioners, we're hungry to grow that because right now it's Chicago and Springfield, right? Like if you ask, Chicago thinks it's its own state, right? And then there's Springfield. Um, I, let me be clear, like you ask most Chicagoans, it's like Chicago is Illinois. Um, <laughs> I hate to say, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a whole rest of the state that's missing from this, these conversations. And so we don't know everybody. Part of why we come to these spaces is to get to know folks on the ground and find out who we're missing, who needs to be part of the conversation. And so we definitely look to you all too with who you all work with on the ground in, you know, in these communities. And could we be a resource? Could we be an asset in those spaces as well? So you kind of mentioned greenwashing. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you about, so I think a lot of um, ideas and movements get hijacked for corporate agenda. Yep. So in your own experience, how have you prevented this or how would you deal with such issues? Well, wouldn't you know, we had a press conference yesterday on this exact matter. Um, okay. So um, the coal power plant in our neighborhood got bought out by Hoko. They're coming with the warehouse, um, and they are tooting this as like this is going to be the best renewable, where, like renewable energy warehouse. Um, it's going to have 600 trees. Um, it's going to be solar ready, which means whoever moves in can put solar on it. They're not going to, but it'll be solar ready. Um, it'll have docking stations for electric cars. Um, and then, um, if you, if anybody's ever been in Chicago, um, this uh, coal power plant is on Pulaski Road, um, which connects an intermodal facility um, to our neighborhood and the highway. Um, and trucks, like it's, 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 it is truck city, like it is dominated by trucks. If you ever read that Stephen King book about the cars and the trucks that come to life? Okay, never mind. That's what it's like. Anyways, um, so um, they, uh, we've, been, we've been coming at them left and right. A warehouse is not green, it's not sustainable. Hundreds of trucks in our neighborhood is not sustainable. Um, and even the demolition of the site, like they demol, this is a, 60 plus year old coal power plant, there is asbestos and lead galore in this building. We have demanded for the last nine months they've been demolishing. We want air monitors. We wanna know if we're breathing in asbestos. We wanna know what the timeline is. They've given us no information, none whatsoever. In fact, 
the city of Chicago told us in August that our best recourse was to close our windows and lock our doors and not go outside. That's what we were told by the Department of Public Health for the city of Chicago. This is the first time a coal power plant is being demolished in the city of Chicago. Every other municipality in Illinois is looking to Chicago to see how they are demolishing this coal power plant. And as of now, they're doing, in my personal opinion, a shit show. Um, so what does Hilco do? Hilco sends out a letter to like, out of the 75,000 people, they send it to like 13,000 people, right? They're like, hey, we're doing a great job. The asbestos is almost all done. And pretty soon you will have a green warehouse here with great jobs, right? So they go into this letter and start talking about how all these trees are gonna be great, how the solar bed is gonna be great, but they give no information, literally no information about how to protect yourself, what's happening. So they send this letter out and then they put out a video, right, on Instagram, this video for their site, like come, come rent this warehouse, come lease for us, look at us, we're in this great, we're in this great city, right? So they show the city of Chicago and all the shots of like B-roll, besides the truck and the warehouse, are of downtown Chicago. Every single shot is like legs walking, you know they're downtown, because the buildings and it's all white legs, and you're like, that's not in the neighborhood. Like that is just not in the neighborhood, right? So this, neighbor, this, this company came in and said, we love Little Village. You all have the best workforce for what we want to do, right? Which was code word for cheap labor, exploited labor, right? Y'all have a great workforce. You all are vibrant culture, right? Like you have great restaurants. All these truck drivers and warehouse workers apparently are going to go eat at your restaurants, right? Like they sold our neighborhood out on these promises, right? They gave out free book bags, um, like all kinds of stupid shit, right? And then their video comes out and there isn't a single iota of a word about our neighborhood in the video. Right, not, not nothing, and in the letter the same thing. And so as a neighborhood, we had a press conference here to say, what in the actual fuck do you think is happening? Like you come into our neighborhood and make all these promises, and then you put shit like this out. I, and I apologize, I swear a lot, I'm so sorry. I'm, my bad, my, if I offend anybody, my apologies, it's just, that's how I communicate. Um, so um, we called them out on their greenwashing. We said, absolutely not. We are not gonna get bought out by Solar Ready. Right? We are not gonna get bought out by 600 trees. And Pulaski Road, the road I was talking about, these morons are like, this warehouse is gonna be so great. We're gonna fix the streets so that bikers and walkers can walk all along here with the trucks. L people, the wo <laughs> there is a lawyer from NRDC who's an avid of a biker and she's like, this is borderline like obscene. The fact that you actually are promoting walkability and bikeability next to a million square foot warehouse on, an, on a road that is literally trucks all day. And, and what's the city doing? <laughs> this is great, right? And we're sitting there like, what, who, what did you put in the Kool-Aid? Like seriously, what is wrong, right? That's greenwashing at its finest, I mean, and what we do is we call it out. We, the way we're doing here is we have to call it out. We, will, we are not going to be, uh, what, how do I put this? We are not going to be used. We are not gonna be puppets. We are not gonna be sold out right, for corporate greed, like, and especially in the city of Chicago where the labor movement started, where the eight hour workday was fought for, right, where our basic labor rights were, people were hung in the, on the street, for the love of God, right, fighting for the eight hour workday. This is the level of, like, um, humanity that we bring to our neighborhood? Is this is the type of shit that we give people? Absolutely not, and so that's where we have to fight and say, you don't, you don't represent us. You do not have our best interests in heart. And in fact, yes, regardless of the fact that we don't speak English, regardless of the fact that we don't have papers, regardless of the fact that we are not of high income, we're gonna fight back and call you out on your bullshit. And that's exactly what we did yesterday, right? Is let our community know, don't believe this shit. And it, the best part is, as soon as people got the letter, boy, they were all over Facebook. Can you believe, the, can you believe, right? And people are like, the audacity, right? People know bullshit when they know, like, please, right? So it's, it's really empowering folks to call that shit out and hold our public officials to, we are not buying that anymore. Like that, those days are long gone. Like with everything we know about climate change, with everything we know about economic justice, with, every, with the fundamental rights that we have as human beings, those days of pitting jobs against the environment, hopefully are long gone behind us, right? And it's conversations like this that bring the labor movement to, with the environmental movement together to understand, right? We have warehouse workers for justice supporting us. Right, they think, at the end of the day, a million square foot warehouse, yes, means more jobs for warehouse workers, but at what cost? Right, how much more fights are they gonna have now to organize and unionize those brothers and sisters in that warehouse, right? So it's really a question of having honest conversations about what these things mean, I mean and holding people accountable, honestly. Yeah, I really liked what you said about building equity and alignment. 
the notion of sticking to your guns and knowing exactly what you want and fighting for your neighborhood and yourself. Um, I, I'm wondering, if, uh, I've also heard about uh, uh, building a coalition where what you want sort of it could be subsumed by a larger uh, uh, issue that might bring other forces together. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a bit about sort of uh, building equity and alignment as well as the building a coalition. Oh, of, uh, coalition work is over. Coalition work is why a girl got gray hairs. Let me be clear. <laughs> All right, coalition work is one of the hardest things. Um, our coal power plant campaign took three coalition tries where literally they imploded, we tried again. It imploded and then we tried again, right? But the reality is, is that coalition work is not gonna function if folks are not aligned, right? Folks have to come to the table and be honest about what is their line in the sand? How far are they willing to go? How far are they willing to hold people accountable? And more importantly, how much funding are you getting to do this work? And is it being equitably distributed amongst all parties around this table? Because I can pretty much guarantee that if for most social struggles, there's a lot of people around the table who are doing that work for free, who are doing that work outside of their full-time job, who are doing that work because they simply care and aren't being compensated or aren't, being, aren't, aren't at the same level that other organizations around the table are. So coalition work can only be as successful as the conversations around funding, the conversations around motive, the conversations around how far people are willing to go, and the conversation on what is your breaking point and when do you simply say no and walk away. In Chicago, one of the bad things that tends to happen is that people will tell you all the things you wanna hear and then the minute that there's an opportunity for them to get a victory, whew, best believe they're taking it. And what we had to do in our coalition was be crystal clear. As soon as Hilco bought that coal power plant, we brought all our allies into the room. And I had to be the very nice person that said, look here, if I catch a single one of you standing outside of Hilco, holding their hand, talking about, look at these green uh, electric parking stations and look at their capacity to be solar ready and y'all are out there smiling and handshaking and acting like this is the best we're gonna get, best believe I'm coming after your asses. Best believe that that is not acceptable. I put, we put every single one of them on notice that we were not gonna be sold out by another institution or big green that didn't align with us value-wise. So if you were gonna play in our pool, these were the rules for our pool. And if you don't wanna play that in our pool, then you need to be crystal clear with me so I know what's coming down the pipeline. And you're clear that should you decide to do this, don't act like you didn't know we were coming after your ass, right? So just being very, right? So I think it's just having honest conversations, right? Because again, I don't know how y'all do it in Champaign, but in Chicago, right, you gotta be crystal clear on your intentions. At least I believe you have to be crystal clear. I don't like coming at people without telling them ahead of time. That's just me.